them. We're starting a series called Supernatural. I'm excited about this series. And so if you are wondering what this is about, maybe you heard me mention it last week. Maybe you're uh, a, a little curious. Um, and you might be asking the question, are we going to get weird? No, we're not going to get weird. Ushers, please bring the poisonous snakes to the front. And uh, just kidding. We'll never do that, I promise. We're not going to get weird, but I believe that there's two common mistakes that churches make. And one of those is an overemphasis of the supernatural. Anybody been to one of those churches? And so we just kind of think like there's a devil behind every bush and every bad thing that happens. We blame on the enemy. We say Satan made me do it. And you might have got an F on your test. You're like it was the enemy's fault, but really you just didn't study. <laughs> so it's not, it's not Satan. It's your lack of preparation. Or maybe you get in a car accident and you're like, man, the, the devil is just really after me today. But you were looking on Instagram to see how many likes your recent post got. That's not, that's not the devil. Instagram might be the devil. But that's not the devil. <laughs> that's another message for another day. But we tend to overemphasize the spiritual. And we overemphasize, even in church services, some people have, have been to these services where they're not letting go. They're not dismissing until God and the Holy Spirit moves in a powerful way and people are falling over and crawling on the ground. Like, we're not dismissing. And sometimes I go two, three, four hours. I don't know if you've been to one of these churches. They're out there. So this is not the type of church you find yourself in today. It's an overemphasis. But then I think more commonly what happens because of that is the pendulum swings the other way. And there's an underemphasis. We don't talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We don't talk about the power of God because maybe we've had some bad experience or we're just afraid of being weird. And so we go, no, no, we're just, we're not going to go there. We're not going to go there. Well, my hope, my prayer in this series is that we go there. Are you ready? We're going to go there, but we're going to go there in a healthy way. Why? Because the Bible says, warning about churches in the end times, that they will have a form of godliness, but deny his power. I don't want to be that church. Anybody? I don't. I don't want to have a form of God. It's like we're, we're kind of going through the motions and, you know, pretending to, to have the power of God. But there's no power evident. There's no supernatural. I'll put it like this. The church of Jesus Christ is supposed to have power. I'll say that again. The church of Jesus Christ is supposed to have power. I don't know if you've experienced this or not. Let's open up the word of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 4, and 5. And again, these are in the app if you want to follow along and fill in the blanks. The Bible says, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. This is a guy named Paul talking. He said, listen, it's not about just the teaching and the preaching. It's about the power that your your faith would be on God's power, not my intellect or my speaking ability. Again, in Acts 1, Jesus says, it's not for you to know the times or the dates, The Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive what? Power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The church is called to preach and to teach the word. Would you agree? However, we are also called to demonstrate the power of God. It's about proclaiming the goodness of God and demonstrating his power. It's about proclamation and demonstration. Now, too many churches, when I survey, there's a whole lot of proclamation going on and not very much demonstration. Have you ever heard of these churches? Have you ever been to these churches? I don't want to be that church. I want to have proclamation and demonstration. I put it like this. The church of Jesus Christ is supposed to have balance. It's not one or the other. It's not, oh man, we're just all about demonstration and it's all about did God show up today as evidence because somebody was not speaking in tongues and they started speaking in tongues or somebody got fell over under the power of God. I mean, I didn't see any miracles today. I mean, there were some sick people and we prayed and I didn't see, it's like we won't be satisfied if we're only after the gifts, but there's got to be a balance. It can't be just teaching and just proclaiming and not seeing the power of God. Jesus modeled this perfectly, didn't he? He went around teaching. They were amazed at his authority. He was showing them insights about the kingdom, about the word. And they're like, how did this guy even get this kind of authority? The, 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 the proclamation was there. And then he would go and serve some people, wash their feet, pray for the sick. People were getting healed. Dead people were getting raised back to life. Like crazy power of God. He did both. Somebody turned to your neighbor and said, he did both. He did both. So it's no surprise then, if God wants his church to have power, 
that our opposition wants to limit the people of God to have power. God wants us to operate in both proclamation and demonstration, to have balance, and the enemy would love to prevent this. Look at the Bible in 2 Corinthians 10. It says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. There is a battle going on. I don't know if you realize this. You're like, what are you talking about, man? My life's pretty good right now. Like, everything's kind of going okay. Like, what? There's no war. Like, what do you... There is a spiritual battle going on. And whether you realize it or not, there is a fight, and the prize is you. All of heaven and God's authority wants you in your heart. And the enemy has a plan and a scheme to take you out. The battle is for you and I. And the Bible says here, we don't use the weapons of the world. We don't use violence and guns and nukes. That's not what we use. We use spiritual weapons, which is what? Prayer and worship and proclaiming the word and the authority of God. Ephesians 6 puts it like this. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you may take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Guess what? We have a real enemy, and he hates your guts. I don't know if that's a newsflash to anybody today, but he wants you dead. Maybe worse, he wants you suffering and miserable and lonely and hurting and useless and ineffective while you're alive. I don't know what's worse. That sounds more terrible to me. Your battle is not against your boss. Your battle is not against your spouse. Your battle is not against your HOA. Hello. (laughs) I'm just preaching myself. Your battle is not against that neighbor that just drives you nuts. Your battle is not against your actual enemy. It's not against Republicans. It's not against against Democrats. It's not against Donald Trump. Oh, we're just going there. All kinds of ways today. Our battle is not against people. I got to say that again because we don't, sometimes we know these things, but there's a difference between knowing it here and getting it here, right? Our battle is not against people. We fight spiritual things. It's not about flesh and blood. It's about the rulers and the authorities of the dark kingdom, the kingdom of darkness. So I'll put it like this. What you see is not all there is. What you see is not all there is. Did you know that there is a spirit realm that is invisible to your naked eye, that is, there's things going on all around us? If we could peel back that realm right now, I believe we would see angels surrounding this place. The Bible says the the Spirit of God inhabits the praises of His people. We just praise God and the Spirit of God is here. There are angels from heaven circulating around and I believe there are demons that are trying to get in and disrupt what God wants to do as well. That's not anything to be afraid of. Why? Because we have the authority. We're going to get into that. But there is so much going on in the spirit realm if we could only see. But here's the good news. You are not alone in your battles. The Bible says in 2 Kings chapter 6, when the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes so he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. God promises to fight our battles for us, to go ahead of us. If we could see these angels, these chariots of fire, these things that are going on, we would understand you're not in your battle alone. When you're frustrated, when you're stressed, when you're feeling depressed, when you're feeling anxiety, when you're up against the challenges of life, know that you are not alone. God has sent ministering angels on our behalf. The Holy Spirit is with us no matter where we are or what time of day it is. He is there. You are not 
alone. The next thing is that you're, you, we need to realize your prayers are far more powerful than you know. Have you ever uh, prayed and gotten an answer quickly? I love when that happens. You're like, wow, that was amazing. Have you ever prayed and not gotten an answer quickly? Yeah, I've been there too. That's less fun. Not, not so fun. The prayers of faith, of those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ, are powerful. Sometimes we see answers quickly. Sometimes the answer delays. And we don't understand always why it's in God's sovereignty and God's timing. But you need to be reminded today that your prayers are more powerful than you know. Look at this story in the book of Daniel chapter 10. Don't be afraid, Daniel, since the first day you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before your God. Your request has been heard in heaven. I have come in answer to your prayer, but for 21 days the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. Then Michael, one of the archangels, came to help me and left, and I left him there with the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. Now I am here to explain what will happen to your people in the future, for this vision concerns a time yet to come. What's going on here? Daniel was praying and fasting. Many of us know now it's called the Daniel fast. Praying and fasting for 21 days. And there was a spiritual battle going on. And because of his prayers, this angel was able to fight this spirit prince of Persia and get the answer and the deliverance to Daniel. His prayers enabled the spirit, the, the, the angel from heaven to overcome that battle to get to him. Our prayers are more powerful than we know. I'm going to say that again, because some of this, I'm building the foundation today, and I think if, if you've been in church a while, you've heard this, and you're kind of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I need to get it in your heart today. I, I need to build from here so that we can go deeper. Are you with me? Your prayers are more powerful than you know. It's easy to get discouraged. It's easy to feel like, oh, man, I prayed for that. It ain't happening. I, it's not, it, I like to think of prayers as like a, um, sometimes when you're facing a mountain, the Bible says, speak to that mountain, it'll be cast into the sea. And we do that, and sometimes the mountain didn't move, and we're like, what the heck? Sometimes our prayers, uh, they're like a, 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 an axe, like a chisel. And you're just you're cracking away at that thing. And you're cracking away at that thing. And, and then eventually, uh, the structure and the foundation starts to weaken, and, and there's a hairline fracture, and you just keep praying. And you keep cracking away at that thing. And you keep cracking away at that thing. And you're like, how come this thing isn't moving? I've been praying. I've been standing on the Word of God. And for too many of us, our story is like, prayer doesn't work. And you give up. And God is here to tell you this morning, your prayers are far more powerful than you know. You got to keep on praying. You got to keep on believing. You got to keep on cracking away at that thing because eventually our prayers combine with our faith, not because we have power, but because of God has ultimate power. That thing will be cast into the sea and it will move. And circumstances will change if you don't give up. Your prayers are affecting the spirit realm. I put it like this. The spirit realm is the causal realm. This is where things begin. This is where things are caused. When you pray, things have to be won in the spirit before you're going to see the victory in the natural. You've got to pray and believe God to, to release that thing, to break that thing, to move, to change the circumstances. You've got to keep on praying and going after it in the spirit realm. Because when you win there, then you start seeing the results in the natural. Some of you have, have prayed and you're not seeing the change in the natural because you haven't yet got the victory in the spiritual. You need to get down on your knees. The Bible says in James 5 that the effective, right, the fervent prayers of a righteous man avail much. The, the fervent prayers. I'm talking about some prayers with some power. You know what I mean? Like there's time and place for, Lord, thank you for this food. I'm grateful. Amen. Like that's a cool prayer. Like say that. That's good. But there's a difference between... We are going to pray until we see God open up the doors and move this thing because no weapon in hell formed against us will prosper. We will see the victory because my God is able to overcome even greater than this. He is in me. The Spirit of God is in me. He is greater than he that's in the world. We will see the victory. There's some fervency behind our prayers that is needed. And we win in the Spirit. And then we start seeing the chain. Some of you are like, man, that's just not my personality. Okay, you go ahead, just stay stuck in your personality. <laughs> I'm just reading the Bible. The Bible says the effective, fervent prayers of a righteous person. Sometimes we need to get a little more fervency, understanding that the spiritual realm is the causal realm. We've got to win the victory there first. So 
What does the devil do? How does he come against us in this thing called spiritual warfare? Just a few things. Number one, he blinds the minds of unbelievers. He blinds the mind. If you can remember, maybe you're here today and you haven't yet placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you can hear the word of God and it'll just bounce off. It will make sense to you. In fact, you might even make fun of it. Think it sounds ridiculous. It doesn't penetrate your mind. It doesn't penetrate your heart. You aren't open to the things of the spirit. Maybe you remember when you were an unbeliever and you heard the word and you were just like, what? That's silly. I'm not going to believe that. Put my faith in that. He, the enemy blinds the minds of the unbelievers. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the God of this age, lowercase g, has blinded the minds of unbelievers. I just said that. <laughs> He blinds the minds. It's one of the ways this is spiritual warfare that the enemy attacks us. The second thing is he steals God's word from you. Matthew 13, 19 says, When anyone hears the message about the kingdom, does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. Have you ever experienced this? Maybe you hear a word on Sunday and you're like, man, that's me. I got to do that. I got to do that. And then it's not even Monday. It's like Sunday evening and it's already gone. It's out. You're like, ah, I'll, I'll do that some other time. It's always later right? It's always tomorrow. When am I going to start dieting? Tomorrow. <laughs> like, when am I going to start getting fit? Next week. Like, it's always, we procrastinate and we put it off and the Word of God gets in our hearts and God does something and His Holy Spirit prompts us to, to actually obey. And like, yes, I do need to start serving. I do need to join a team. I do need to start trusting God with my finances. I want to see breakthrough there. I want to see provision. I do need to forgive. And all these things He stirs up, right? And we're like, yes, I should. And then the enemy steals it away. The other thing is, the enemy does, he sets traps to ensnare you. In 2 Timothy 2, it says, And they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil, who has taken them captive to do his will. If you're tempted in an area, the enemy wants to set you up. He wants to trap you. If you're trying to like spend less and not go shopping, there's going to be a sale. Like every time, right? That's just how it works. Or... If you're trying to leave like a party lifestyle, and like, man, I just got to stop. I got I to gotta stop hanging out with those guys. Your buddy will call you and be like, Kegger, tonight, like every time. It's how it works. You're trying to pur purify your mind, live righteously, put God first, lustful thoughts, lustful images. I mean, you don't have to look far for those. They're everywhere, right? Wherever your weaknesses are, he wants to set traps to trip you up. Remember, he hates your guts. He wants you to fail. Another thing he does is he fights to stop you. For we wanted to come to you, certainly I, Paul, did, again and again, but Satan stopped us, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 2. Every time you, you start to do something, you, you take a, a, a step of faith and obedience towards God. The enemy wants to limit you. He wants to put a roadblock to prevent your progress. This is spiritual warfare. This is what... He does. You finally go, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust God. The Bible says if I give him the first fruits of my finances, first 10%, he's going to open up the windows of heaven. He's going to bless me. So here we go. <sighs> Dang it. That was tough. And then what happens? The car breaks down. <laughs> right? The fridge stops working. You get an unexpected bill. You got over, like, over and above the regular bills. All this starts happening out of nowhere. The enemy is trying to stop you from stepping out in faith. He's trying, if he can get you early before you develop the discipline and the habit, he's, he, can, he can succeed at making you ineffective. And then the last thing he does is he plans to destroy you. Make no mistake, the enemy hates you. This is spiritual warfare. Part of the supernatural is understanding that there is a battle going on. There is spiritual warfare. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, the enemy of the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He calls the enemy, the devil, a lion. Lions a feline. Felines are the devil. I'm just saying. It's in the Bible. If you're a cat person, sorry. I'm just reading the Bible. Just kidding. I don't hate cats. Just don't like them very much. The enemy wants to destroy your life. But here's the good news, guys. <laughs> he can't win. We have a greater authority. We have power and access to the supernatural to give us the victory over the attacks of the enemy.
There is a spiritual battle going on, but guess what? I have read the end of the book. I know the authority and the power God has given each of us who have placed our faith in Him. I understand that God is the creator and the enemy was just a created thing who got prideful and got kicked out of heaven. Him and all His demons are created things. They're minions. If we could really peel back the spirit realm and see these, we wouldn't be afraid of them. We would understand they're just the cockroaches of the spirit realm. And we have the authority to crush those bad mamma jammas under our foot in Jesus' name, speaking the word of God and declaring what He wants to see accomplished. So how do we do this? Ephesians chapter 6, the Bible says, Therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. This is literally your battle armor. Remember, we don't fight with the weapons of this world. It's not physical. It's not guns. It's not brass knuckles. Sorry for some of you who grew up in the hood. Like, it's a totally different situation. This is spiritual weapons. And you got to start with the helmet of salvation. You need to start by covering your mind, your head, with the knowledge that you are saved, you are forgiven, you are redeemed, you don't get what you deserve. When we understand whose we are, we can understand who we are and step out in our God-given authority. When we forget the, the power of our salvation, the Bible says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why? For it is the power of God. When we understand we are saved, then the attacks of the enemy and the lies and the fiery arrows that come in, you're no good, man. You're going to get what you deserve. You're never going to amount to anything. You're never going to get out of this debt. You're never going to live a life that makes a difference. You're, you're never going to measure up. When you hear the lies that just keep coming at you, you understand, no, 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 I'm saved. I'm forgiven. I'm redeemed. I am called. I am not just a sinner. I am saved by grace, and I am now in the family of God. I am a son. I am a daughter of the King of Kings. I am whole. I am being perfected. I am sanctified. I am blessed. I am anointed. Every one of my days was established before me. I am created to do good works. I am the craftsmanship and the worksmanship of God. He is the creator. He is the author. He is the finisher, and I will see this through because I'm not who I used to be you got to start with the helmet of salvation. And once you got that on, then it's time to put on the breastplate of righteousness. What does that mean? Righteousness is your good works. I'm here to tell you this morning, you're not righteous. <laughs> Neither of us, none of us are. The Bible says there's not one righteous. And then it emphasizes, no, not even one. <laughs> like, none of y'all. Some of you are like, yeah, that's, I, yeah, that's me. Listen, it's okay. It's okay because the Bible says put on the breastplate of righteousness. We put on the righteousness of Christ. It says elsewhere that we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. When God looks down at you, he doesn't see your good works. He doesn't see your bad. He sees the, the breastplate of righteousness, the purity and the perfection of Jesus Christ around you. You need to remind yourself. I'm not who I, I used to be. I'm not the mistakes of my past. I'm not what I do or what I don't do. I am the righteousness of Christ. I, you need to just say that out loud until you start believing it. I am the righteousness of Christ. You see how this will change your perspective? This will change your attitude as you start attack, attacking your problems. When you're, when you're going at it in your own strength, man, you're going to lose every time. But you put on the helmet of salvation, understanding who you are. You take the, the breastplate of righteousness. You're starting to get strapped up. You start to get ready for battle. And then we defeat the negative thoughts and the attacks of the enemy with the shield of faith which is able to extinguish all the fiery darts. How many of you had fiery darts come your way ever from the enemy? You know what these look like. This is those thoughts just coming at you, and you start feeling bad, and you start getting down, and then maybe it's actually circumstances that advance where you're just like, man, everything's just going wrong today. Have you ever just had one of those days? You wake up, and like, first thing you do is you stub your toe. And you're like, come on, man. And then you go to, you know, make your coffee, and you're out of creamer. It's like, this is not going to be a good day. I'll tell you right now. Got no cream. Some of you are like, I drink my coffee black. That's awesome, man. I'm not as manly as you. That's cool. I'm just saying, I like my coffee with some cream. <laughs> Give me some half and half, too. None of that flavors business. That's all good. But some days just go bad. 
and the enemy just starts capitalizing, right? And he's throwing stuff your way and negative thoughts and we're the only created thing that can change the way we feel by changing the way we think. And the enemy knows this. And he wants to attack your mind. And so we put on the shield of faith. What is that? Faith to believe that God's word is true over what the enemy is saying about you. When the enemy is saying, you're good for nothing, you're, a sin- you're just always going to be broke, you're always going to be stuck, it's not going to get better, you're hopeless, your future is dark, when he's just bringing all that, you got to know the word of God, putting on the shield of faith, saying, no, my God is for me. And if he is for me, who or what can stand against me? He says that his plans for me are good, plans to give me a hope and a future. He says that he has lined out every one of my days, that he has blessed me, that he has purpose, potential inside of me, that he has given me skills and gifts to be used for his kingdom, that he loves me, that he wants me to make an impact for his glory, that he has so much good for us. But we have to know the word so that we can put on the shield of faith. And then the Bible says we're our feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace. This is how you can go through the difficulties and the storms and the struggles of life with that peace that surpasses understanding. And this is a loud testimony. Let me tell you, when you're going through all sorts of chaos, all sorts of hell, and you just kind of walk about with some peace, and the people around you, believers and non-believers, are asking the question whether verbally or not, how in the world are they so peaceful? If I were to go through that, I would be a mess. But when you put on the shoes fitted with the gospel of peace, you can walk through life's circumstances with that supernatural peace. And as you put all these things together, the spiritual battle that is going on for your soul doesn't stand a chance. Did you know that there are two wills at work here? God's will for your life, and it is good. He wants to bless you. He wants you to have a hope in the future. And the enemy's will, as we've said, he, he hates your guts. He, he's the son of a motherless goat. Like nobody... He wants to kill you, destroy you, steal from you, rob your joy. So we have the choice. We can align ourselves with God's will, which is good, or inadvertently with the enemy's will, which he wants to kill and destroy us. Now, I don't, I've never met anybody who goes... Yeah, I want to do the enemy's will. Like, sign me up. Where did I get my pentagon? Like, that's not how it... Am I saying that? Is that the right word? Pe- pe- pentagram. I thought it felt wrong. Thank you. <laughs> need all... need some help. <laughs> pentagon. That's... We love the pentagon. <laughs> Censorship. Sorry. It's all good. <laughs> pentagram! Nobody wakes up, they're like, I want to worship the devil. That's not how it works, right? But how it works is when we don't submit, when we don't surrender to God's will, we are doing the enemy's will without even knowing it. When you're not putting on the full armor of God, you are getting thrown and tossed around by all these attacks without protection. And notice, of all the pieces of the armor of God, your front is covered. You got the the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. This is how you overcome, just like Jesus did. The enemy was like, just throwing all these accusations. Oh, if you really are the son of God, why don't you throw yourself? And what did he say? It is written. He proclaimed the word of God. I don't have to listen to all your noise. It is written. And he spoke out the word of God. That is our weapon. We speak out the word of God into the spirit realm. And things change. Whether you see it with your natural eye or not. Speaking out the word of God. Proclaiming brings the demonstration. We've got to get better at speaking out the word of God. Well, some people might think I'm weird. Josh, let's go around. Listen, let them think they're weird when they're getting all attacked and beat up by the enemy. You are going to be protected. You're going to be wielding your sword. Going, you know what, enemy? I ain't putting up with this no more. <laughs> the spirit, it, it's our weapon. And when we use all the the battle gear, we put on the armor. There's one thing I noticed, there's, there's nothing to cover your back. You're exposed, you're vulnerable. I started thinking about this, I'm like, why? Well, one, I don't think we're meant to retreat. But two, I think the bigger thing is, 
brothers and sisters around you are meant to have your back. When you're feeling down, when you're feeling attacked, that's why we say it like this all the time, man, we're better together. There is strength in numbers. When you're on your own, you're vulnerable. The enemy would love to just pick you off by yourself. Oh, man, I didn't, I didn't like what that pastor said. I'm not going to church anymore. Okay, you're on your own. We are better together. There's strength in numbers. You put on the full armor of God, and then your brothers and sisters cover your back. And the last point is this, is we don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. Maybe you've heard this before, but I liken it to it's, uh, it's, all, it's, all, it's October, and so we're in postseason baseball. I know everybody's crazy about football, but it's postseason baseball right now. Can I get an amen? Thank you, Jesus. I'm sorry. You guys don't have a team. That's why you're not excited. You can support the Dodgers right now. They're in, and uh, I like I li <laughs> some spiritual warfare going on right now. Get behind me, Satan. <laughs> you can look at a team like you got the Dodgers and you can look at the stats, right? And they look favored to win. They look better. And so there's a battle going on on the field and you're like, who's going to win? Is it, of course, it's probably the Dodgers. They're from Los Angeles. Los Angeles means the angels. God's in it. God's in it. I'm just saying, I haven't done many Dodger jokes at all, like all season. So they're all coming out right now. And the battle's on the field, and you're like, I don't know who's going to win. You don't know. You don't know. But the difference is, in the spirit realm, we know who's going to win. We have so much more power and authority available to us. As I said, God is the creator. He is the king of kings. He is the author and finisher of life. He created Satan. He was named Lucifer, a worship leader in heaven. He got prideful, warning to you worship leaders. And God kicked him out of heaven. And he became evil. And he, he has a third of the angels with him. His minions, his demons. He's a created thing. God can snap his fingers and end it all. It's not a battle. It's not about, oh, are we going to win? Is he going to win? No. We don't fight from a place for victory. Like, is this going to work? No, we, pro we fight from victory, knowing that the battle is won, that we do have the power. We do have the authority. As we put on the armor of God and we step out and do what his word says, we will see the victory. The band can come up and help me make this point because we're going to sing that song again. We will see a victory. And we're going to pray. Our, as I said, our weapons are not carnal. They're not of this world. We don't use guns and bombs. We use prayer and we use worship. And when we apply the word of God to our life, we see victory in our situation. By show of hands, how many of you are going through a battle right now of some sort? Look at all these hands. I declare this morning that we're going to see some things broken in Jesus' name. We're going to see some battles won in the spirit realm so that we will then start to see the change in the natural. How are we going to do that? We're going to sing again. We're going to praise God. And we are going to declare with our mouths, I will see a victory. And we are going to pray and we are going to ask God to do what he does and fight and battle on our behalf. Does that sound good? So as the band gets prepared, would you stand to your feet? I'm going to ask you to do something brave today. We don't always do this, but we're in a series called Supernatural. We all understand now there is a very real spirit realm. There is a battle for your life, for your finances, for your marriage, for your health. There's a battle for your peace, for your joy, your sense of purpose, your hope. The enemy wants to steal and destroy all of these things. But well, we don't have to be afraid, do we? <laughs> because the battle is already won. So we're going to pray and we're going to sing and we're going to believe that God is going to break some things in this place in the mighty name of Jesus. That things behind the curtain, the unseen, are going to change. And enemies and demons are going to flee. 
and sicknesses are going to be cured. And breakthroughs that you've been praying and believing for for years are going to open up. And the floodgates of heaven are coming at you. And the Holy Spirit of God is here. He wants to speak to your mind. He wants to speak to your heart. He wants to give you a fresh word from heaven today, knowing that one word from God is greater than millions of words from men. And heaven is here to meet you today if you believe it. So as the band plays, and if you would like prayer for something that is going on, I'm going to ask our prayer partners to come forward. I'm going to ask you to do something brave and come to the altar and receive prayer. And we're going to pray in faith and believe that God's going to answer our prayers. Amen? Come on, let's sing.